Well, th thank you for coming out this afternoon. I know some people will be uh, trickling in. Um, I know most of you, um, I'm learning more and more. Um, I'm John Murata. I'm one of the geriatricians from uh, the Bayview uh, campus. And I've been coming out for about a year and a half or so, about once a week or so, um, to, uh, to work with you. And uh, I think it's a great place. I really, I really do. I was uh, asked um, a couple of uh, months ago if I might uh, speak at the rounds. Um, am I being picked up on the mic? Is that okay? Good. So um, I said, sure, expecting to do a presentation on cognition, memory, Alzheimer's, which I can do in my sleep and have the latest literature. So I was asked to talk about urinary tract infection in the elderly. I said, why? So <laughs> we know what's going on. <laughs> so I went back and uh, thank God I started this about three, four weeks ago. Because every night I've been reading through another paper, another paper, and another paper. Because I realized that was a very good topic. There's a fair bit of controversy. So I... Uh, thought it might be interesting to uh, use my, my kids when they were a little bit younger. I uh, really loved a Mythbusters show. I don't know how many of you like that. Yeah, it's, it's off the air, but it'll be coming back. So I figured if I use the name, they won't come after me necessarily because the show's not on. And there are actually a lot of myths out there. Uh, not that I can debunk everything, and not actually that we know everything. Um, so I was amazed as I went back to look what, um, what controversies there are, what, what gaps uh, exist. So uh, we'll go on and um, uh, feel free. Uh, I, I know there's about 25, 30 people. I'm okay if you stop, say, hey, I have a question. It means that in between lunch bites, you're... I'm actually getting your interest, so feel free to put the hand up, I'll, I'll pause. So here we go. So um, this is actually an important area, and I thank um, Morris Toshinsky for putting it forward. Uh, so the issue is uh, urinary tract infection in the elderly. Urinary tract infection in people under the age of 75, middle age, young adults, pregnant women, um, children, adolescents, it's pretty figured out. I mean, there's still issues, but in the elderly, um, it's important because it is the number one infection in the emergency room um, in North America, likely Western Europe, and to our fellow Matt Neva here in the front row, to Australia, New Zealand as well. I'm sure he's from New Zealand and spending a year with us. Um, so yes, there as well. And that uh, it is the first or second most common uh, hospital um, infection. Uh, women, unfortunately, face about a 50% risk of having a urinary tract infection in their lifetime. And again, I'm gearing more towards the 75 and over group. In Atlanta, the Centers for Disease Control say that um, in the Western world, uh, they talk pretty much American-centric, but again, they reach out into the developed world that about 40% of what we call urinary tract infections are actually over-treated and over-treated with antibiotics and there's concern. So I went through looking for some evidence and uh, perhaps for my benefit, hope for yours as well, you probably know this, that we go through the different levels of evidence. So our best evidence is level one evidence where we have uh, research done looking prospectively. So we would say, gee, um, is there a urinary tract infection happening here? How do we treat it? What do we do? So we randomize people to a treatment. It might be a medicine. It might just be an approach of how we assess people. And then we have a placebo group. So you either go into the treatment group or the placebo group. So that's our best evidence in terms of what are we doing, does it make sense? In the absence of that, 
And often in preparation for coming up with a good level one study, we look at level two evidence. These are the cross-sectional or retrospective chart reviews, case control studies, and we're trying to figure out from there what might be the factors that are important in this area, urinary tract infection and the elderly, as we're trying to um, break up what may be some of the myths and come up with some of the truths. But what we see on level two cross-sectional studies is a suggestion, really. And that's really interesting. Until we have level one, is the best we have, and we be mindful that we may be making some uh, wrong assumptions, that we're not quite picking up all the factors that may be present. So I just wanted to bring that forward because as you, I take you through a couple of the studies that I looked at, um, there's one level one study, and the rest are level two. And we've got level three, where a bunch of people who are considered experts sit around the table, somewhere nice like Niagara on the Lake, or <laughs> <laughs> as they have dinner, they go, oh, let's try and do the best we can and um, see if we can come up with the same story that spreads the blame a bit, which um, until we have better evidence is the best that we have. And looking at this area, there's a fair bit of uh, level three recommendations for the elderly. So I was quite surprised. So the big one is, what is urinary tract infection in the elderly? So uh, really where a lot of controversy lies is not in the group, as you see at the beginning, with pyelonephritis or bacteremia. We agree, those people have a life-threatening infection. We may figure out afterwards, they come, they're really sick, they're sick on the ward, that, oh my gosh, it's in the blood, and that's E. coli, and we found that in the urine. That's not where our controversy is. Um, and after looking some more, it's not where we see bacteria in the urine, bacteria uh, with no symptoms. Uh, it's not in the category of people who have um, spinal cord injuries, multiple sclerosis, who have uh, or, or developmental um, abnormalities, or some of the chronic progressive neurological disorders where they have a neurogenic bladder and have either intermittent catheters or permanent catheters and become sick. Uh, there's little controversy there. It really is in uh, the hospital, the emergency department, in long-term care where I go a lot, uh, the most common infection, the cystitis kind of syndrome. or there's bacteria and white cells in the urine. Is there an infection here? Should we treat it? That's where the controversy is. So, myth busting. Okay, urine should be sterile. Well, we're learning that um, for practical purposes, uh, young adults, when we send a urine off to the lab, it should come back negative. Uh, this particular study referenced here, it's from three years ago, looked at women who were actually in the adult group who are going for um, a gynecological uh, surgery. Uh, so they actually took urine samples um, and did some very fancy um, bacterial culture. So like we know now about a gut microbiome, mouth microbiome, there is actually a bladder urine microbiome. Our microbiology labs in hospitals are really not set up to show that, but it's, it's there. And uh, this was seen in this cohort. And I'll show you a busy slide next to show you what they found is in the urine or bladder microbiome. And it's pretty tiny there, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of good gram negatives, um, anaerobes, they, they're good bugs. They tend to um, help the bladder avoid colonization by pathogenic bacteria. So in truth, the urine's not sterile. It's not sterile in adults. It's not sterile in the elderly. The worry in the elderly is are we promoting pathogenic colonization? Okay. 
So, uh, as we get older, uh, as we live longer, we have more time to get disease. In the absence of disease, in geriatric medicine, we talk about age-related changes. So, anatomical changes which come because of age in the absence of disease are, are there. Um, women face more challenges because of some of the anatomical changes. And as you see there, half of women over their lifetime will get a urinary tract injection, a real one. Um, the risk is 14 times more than that of men. For men, as the prostate hypertrophies, there are more issues. And um, for women, the loss of estrogen uh, postmenopause uh, changes the bacterial flora. Uh, what, what can colonize the bladder in women tends to come, and for men as well, from our large bowel, from the rectal area, from the perineal area. So having uh, a good colony of lactobacillus, you know, the stuff in probiotics, in the uh, perineal area for women is a very protective um, uh, a very protective state. Um, as we get older, for all of us, the T cells become kind of sluggish. Uh, they're very helpful at uh, preventing infections, bladder infections as well. And because of all these, or these factors here, again, these factors in the absence of, let's say, disease, age-related colonization of the bladder happens that our labs can pick up, unlike this kind of microbiome, which they don't pick up. They pick up um, the gram negatives, the usual bugs we know about. Nutritional state in the absence of disease tends to get worse. Uh, is it age related? Is it society related? Well, it's not disease related, but, but it does happen. And it is a factor here. Um, I just wanted to show you um, a schematic of to the female pelvis. Now, I don't know if we have a pointer. Uh, I forgot to ask uh, about that, so I may step away from the microphone to point. Just one or two things. Again, this is normal, and, um, oh, thank you, Nancy. The pointer there? Super. Okay, let's see. They won't look at it, just. <laughs> <laughs> cool, yeah, there it is, great, okay. Here we are, and I won't shine it on the airplane. So uh, bladder, uterus, large bowel, and obviously the anatomical proximity. So here, this is all where it should be, and we're, it works well. The residual volumes here after peeing are small, so the bladder flushes itself out. The mechanics are quite good, and again, uh, before menopause, here, good estrogen levels, so we are seeing a lot of lactobacilli here to avoid contamination from uh, the uh, gram negatives in the large bowel. Anatomical changes that um, can be age-related but can be pathological, the uh, uterine descent uh, prolapse, changing the anatomy, um, the anatomical position of the bladder, leading to difficulty with emptying. So more residual volume in the bladder means that you get gram negatives that can make their way up. There's no lactobacilli to block the progress, so it's a pretty short pathway up the urethra to colonize, and the bladder's got some nice warm urine there. If the person is diabetic, there's sugar in there. It's a great place to hang out. You got some bad squatters, I see. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Men don't escape some of this stuff either. We run into trouble with the aging. Most men see hypertrophy of the prostate and bacteria will colonize this area and prostatitis, bacterial prostatitis is nasty, it takes months to settle down. It doesn't happen so often when it does, it's nasty. Hypertrophy of the 
prostate leads to larger residual volumes. And again, more diabetes, sugar, the issues are, are certainly there, but overall the risk isn't as much. But when it does happen, it's quite significant, the urinary tract infection in a man. So myth number two, we all agree on what is urinary tract infection in the elderly. Um, and again, I'm focusing more on cystitis, bladder infection. We agree on pyelonephritis, acute prostatitis, bacteremic uh, pyelonephritis. When does an elderly person have a urinary tract infection in the bladder? And I'm looking through and looking through and there are definitions, but not necessarily a real agreement. Um, so a number of good people, groups from around the world, and actually you'll see another paper shortly from uh, the Bayview campus and from uh, McMaster 15 years ago, 12 years ago, trying to sort this out and put standards for, I, uh, forward. I was quite amazed to see that there wasn't really a general agreement. So, uh, we know if we send a urine off, and the lab tells us there's more than 10 to the fifth colony forming units, one bacterium, and it looks pathogenic, or from a catheter specimen that's a fresh one, more than 10 to the third colony forming units, that there is, uh, there's bacteria there, and we don't think that's normal. Uh, we also want to see symptoms relating to the area. Then in the very elderly with cognitive difficulties, we wonder, do we really need to see symptoms or hear of symptoms? Uh, maybe we can find some signs. And, th and, that, and that's the challenge. The challenge is in our frail, vulnerable population we have here, certainly in long-term care and with um, in the acute hospital with people who enter with a delirium or people who have a pre-existing dementia, the clinical part is the challenge. That's where um, we struggle. So myth number three, we know the urinary tract infection, asymptomatic bacteria, white cells, that's, that, that's a urinary infection. Well, probably not. Not unless we've got something clinical that guides us to the bladder, is that the case? And again, this uh, is probably why the Centers for Disease Control, the other groups are saying that we're over-diagnosing uh, cystitis, so bladder infection. Again, not pyelonephritis, not bacteremic uh, urinary infection, but really it's the cystitis. Are we overcalling it? So there's an interesting study done, published 2013 in France. It's quite a big study for uh, urinary tract infection. Can we agree on this um, clinical syndrome with laboratory uh, results thrown in? Looking at one week in 20 hospitals in France. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a cross-section consecutive observational study. So they looked at people age 75 and over, and they looked at from a 48 different hospital wards in one week, people who had urinary tract uh, cultures and came in. So they found that uh, people who, were, uh, who got urinary cultures done uh, for clinical reasons shown up in the emergency department or in hospital that half the time uh, the urinary cultures were negative. So there was a suspicion that there might be infection. Half the time they were negative. Half the time they were positive. It's these positive cases where the lab says, you got some bugs here. We have 10 to the fifth organisms in the non-catheterized uh, urine or 10 to the third organisms in the catheterized patient. So they found um, 241 cases out of the 48 wards, most of the wards were geriatric. Then they 
agreed to get the clinicians on the ward to do a standardized questionnaire that was triggered by a positive urine culture in a patient on the ward. So in that standardized questionnaire, they marked down medical or surgical history of the patient. Was this patient uh, coming in with an acquired infection, with a, with a community acquired infection? So it was a urine that led the day of admission or a few days or weeks into hospital admission. Was a catheter or not? And were there typical urinary symptoms or typical systemic symptoms? So the goal was to try and get a clinical profile and a laboratory profile in the elderly and then compare that to what was written on the discharge summary. What's the diagnosis here? What's this person got to see what kind of correlation we were getting based on this sheet? It's very interesting what they found. So. Um, there were a good number of people who came through, 36 admissions to the ward over a week. So they, took, they got out of 1,700 or so patients, they got uh, 243 positive cultures from about 500 cultures that were taken. So it's already interesting that they're taking cultures, two cultures to get one positive one, which is interesting. Uh, Two out of three patients were female, which makes sense, um, higher risk. Very interesting that half of the people with positive cultures were people who've been readmitted in the previous six months. So did we give them a little gift in their previous hospital visit <laughs> that they brought back? <laughs> Question. Very interesting is a quarter of the people had had a urinary tract infection in the previous three months. And again, it wasn't looked at this way, but there was a diagnosis. 20% had catheter or some significant urological problem. Um, half of the infections came from being in hospital. That is, it was triggered. It wasn't, they didn't arrive with a urinary infection. They picked one up in the hospital. 13% were bacteremic, and again, we agree, we know these people are sick. They're not part of the myth, is this urinary tract infection or not. What's remarkable is that a quarter of people who had a positive urine culture had a second infection, which was almost always a pneumonia. It's really interesting, we'll touch on that in a moment. It's a busy slide here. There are a couple of points from it to make. So here are the points in the slide. And forgive me, uh, I'm not sure how I can move. I'll, I'll tell you what's up here, because this is quite important. Uh, the first column are people who have bacteria in the urine or colonization. That is, clinically, we feel, yeah, there's some bacteria there, but this person doesn't have a urinary tract infection. That's what the clinician had said. This person has a bladder infection, cystitis, and the, again, clinically, that's what the clinician had said. The laboratory gave us a positive urine culture. These are all people with positive urine cultures, the 241. They lost complete data on two, so that's why they have, we only have 241 rather than 243. And these are people, the parenchymus inf infection, a parenchymatous infection is from the translation. The original paper was written in French. They mean pyelonephritis or prostatitis. They're the ones who are really sick. So people who were colonized, half the people had no symptoms, but half had symptoms. Symptoms, and I, I learned the term. Did people, does anybody know what polycuria is? No? Oh, good. I had to look that up, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is. It's, I have to go pee every 10 minutes, but only a little bit. And I cannot wait. That's polycuria. I learned a new word, a medical term. I, there you go. So, and it may again be that French translation. 
of a Greek term. <laughs> so fascinating. So some typical symptoms. So uh, fascinating is that, again, uh, half the people who the clinicians felt were colonized had symptoms because half did not. That's very interesting. So we rely on symptoms. And with colonization, it's like 50-50. So at the, at the bottom here, you'll see, and there again, they did a t-test for symptoms and are they correlated? Is there a difference if clinically somebody has a bladder infection? We're pretty confident about that. Are there any symptoms that help us distinguish between colonization and a bladder infection or the one we really worry about, pyelonephritis? Is there any distinction? So, so B is the one we're wondering about. So the difference between colonization and cystitis. Um, so I'm, I think I'm losing my pointer a bit. The, maybe the, or am I not pointing correctly? Maybe the battery is going a bit on it. No, 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 that's right. I'm there. there, it's there. Oh, there, okay. It's, it's fading. So the first three. So... No, that's right. No symptoms. Absence of the, uh, uh, I got to go often a little bit, the polycuria. Absence of that and absence of dysuria. Uh, so not having any of those with a positive urine culture is very likely the uh, colonization. Only that's, you can hang your hat on. And that's down here in B, the difference between colonization and true infection that merit some treatment. So the, the C, again, is the only other uh, statistically significant symptom to give us a lead is uh, bladder distension, fever, or chills. That item tells us the difference that we got somebody who's sick with prostatitis or polynephritis if we have those clinical symptoms. And notice that pelvic pain, lumbar pain, even incontinence, weren't strongly differentiating. And the other one, which I think was very interesting at the very bottom, confusion did not seem to clear up, forgive me, confusion about which one of these clinical syndromes. It didn't point to anything reliably. That's a surprising piece that came out of that. So half the people with colonization, with bacteria in the urine culture, um, we're free of symptoms. Um, and then a bunch of people who did have symptoms with bacteria did not turn out to actually have a bladder infection. So we're kind of stuck. After I read this the first time, I had to put it away, come back a couple of days later and reread it to try and understand. Uh, what does that mean? Um, and, and again, that... Um, uh, do we have somebody with cystitis, a true bladder infection or not? Uh, how can we figure that out? I've just lost some of the symptoms that I really look for, or findings that I look for, uh, because um, uh, now I'm not sure where to go. Uh, the symptoms that best guide us if we think somebody's colonized and not infected are, are you not having any frequency, any burning, the dysuria, or any incontinence, though I'm not sure why they put that in the paper. And I've lifted that from the paper when the stats didn't show that. I have a chance to write in and say, why did you put incontinence when that's not showing up on your stats? So I'm not quite sure about that. So the most helpful symptom is um, the polycure, the, the new word we, I learned, and you've learned now, in terms of correlation to cystitis the frequency, small amounts of urine, which is new. The best symptom complex correlated to the serious infections, the systemic fevers, gross hematuria, bladder distension. And the surprising finding was that 30% of people who they were looking for infection, they did urine cultures, actually turned out to have pneumonias. And that was what needed to be treated, not what was going on in the bladder, but for the pyelonephritis group. And that got me so 
the people who have colonization in the bladder but are not well, make sure you check their chest if they're over 75 because 30% of them actually had a real chest infection. That was a surprise to me. So only a third of the cases actually fit what I had learned, which I'm still kind of getting over that. And a quarter of patients, um, again, a quarter to 30% with a urinary syndrome also had a pneumonia, which is very important. Also, the absolute white count, whether it was up or down, wasn't helpful for cystitis or bladder infection. As well, the geriatric syndromes of an acute functional decline, acute confusion, didn't have a good correlation to the presence or absence of urinary tract infection. So there we go. Um, so how do we define urinary tract uh, infection in the elderly? And really we're looking at bladder infection because pyelonephritis, we know, bacteremia, we know. The asymptomatic colonization, we're a little more comfortable with. The elderly, the 50% will have bacteria in the urine we can culture. They'll have white cells. The white cells may be helping keep things under control. Putting in antibiotics might make a mess. That's where I was starting to think unless they're sick and it pointing me to a more significant urinary syndrome. Okay, so uh, who are the really, really sick and what happens? Uh, this was an Israeli study, again, looking at people coming to hospital in Israel who turned out to have bacteremia with a urinary infection, looking at about 200 people. The reason I put this out, this study is from 2004, is that we worry, but hey, if we don't treat that bladder infection, will it turn into pyelonephritis and bacteremia and kill this person? Well, the answer is no. It, it, there isn't a correlation. It doesn't seem to start there and then go up. They either show up with pyelonephritis and bacteremia, or they don't have it, or they show up with pyelonephritis, we treat that. But cystitis does not beget pyelonephritis. And doesn't, cystitis doesn't beget bacteremia from the work in a, several of these studies, and that's quite important. Um, also, uh, in this project here where they looked at, in Israel, these 190 cases of bacteremic people with urinary infection, they were worried, like, who are the sick people who are going to die? Because we worry about, what's the profile? So, what came from it was that, and again, we're looking at Correlation, so there's uh, uh, male, female equal here. We got a bunch of older people, age 75 and up, 75 to 85, 100 people, 85 to 94, 76. So a good number of people, people from the community, people from long-term care, hospital acquired, community acquired, catheters there, not there. So that's the profile. So it's a good profile. Gram negatives are the main organisms, 80, almost 90% of the time and the enterococcus, uh, the gram-positive, by 10% of the time. So uh, what is bad in terms of predicting you're going to die from the bacteremia? Age, is that a factor that's significant? No. If you come in at 90 and age alone, it, it, won't, uh, it won't win or lose the bet that way. It's actually, and neither does gender, what actually works is what seems to be more of a profile, like the surgical, the elderly person who's going for surgery, she's going to get a general anesthetic. It's what are your comorbidities? And that's a big issue. And diabetes is not one of the ones that makes a difference here, at least from what they saw. Interestingly, the presence of pre-existing urinary incontinence at the very bottom is an important, was an important predictor of mortality in this group. And a third of the people died there. So the use of catheters, yep, not good. Where you come from didn't matter. Uh, where you got your infection didn't seem to matter, which was a bit surprising because I thought the superbugs were in the hospital, but it seemed to work. It may be different 13 years later because this is 2004. Cognitive status made a big difference. 
and also functional ability made a big difference. So I thought about this and I said, hey, all the good work here to get people more functional, maybe that's helping people get through these bad infections. And the duration of hospitalization, like my grandparents said um, to me, you go, the older Italian immigrants said, you go to the hospital to die, not to get better. <laughs> so the longer time you spend in there, the more chance they have of killing you. I said, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> There's a little grain of truth to that. The organisms, again, didn't seem to matter. It was the host's overall strength. The length of the stay did matter, dementia did matter again, and the number of problems you had mattered. So I just wanted to cover that one because it's important to know that the serious infects, about 13% of cases, and being frail, having lots of problems, having dementia, not having good nutritional state, and not being mobile is bad, not a good thing. Age isn't on its own a bad thing. Myth number four, smelly urine means in cloudy urine you have an infection. No, the best correlation is to dehydration. Gross hematuria uh, is correlated strongly to pyelonephritis, prostatitis, Gross pyuria, pus in the urine, that's a different story. But the foul-smelling cloudy urine is actually not a good marker. Clear urine that doesn't smell bad is a pretty strong marker that there's no infection. So the opposite is true, but the cloudy, smelly urine isn't, isn't going to win you the bet. Okay? So the other thing that's come about from uh, more work, and this is from... Um, uh, the Journal of Infectious Diseases, five placebo controlled trials really got me thinking of uh, people with clinical acute cystitis who were not treated, did not have a higher risk of going on to pyelonephritis. That's important because I worried about that. Gee, there's a bladder infection here. Should we treat it? And the answer is and not necessarily. And that's still a little bit foggy. We don't quite know. There were a couple of studies done, again, the level one evidence, and this is one of them where um, people were randomized, women were randomized with cystitis clinically to get um, uh, antibiotic or Advil. And the people on antibiotic, the women with antibiotic, got better one day earlier mm -hmm. than the women who had cystitis. And you know, they could take fluids, acidify the urine, uh, and so on, and take your Advil it cleared up. It's a bit like the common cold, I think. You'll get better in seven days, or it might take a week, but you'll get better, <laughs> depending on what you do. So the other one that was quite interesting from the studies, and I'm just mindful of the time, is that delirium falls and confusion weren't helped by sterilizing the urine. It didn't make that better. There's another project, that, uh, sorry, another big study, 500 nursing home residents looked at over a year, urine cultured, and their worries were there was cognitive change, behavior change, character of the urine had changed, that um, they really did not find um, that there was a clinically meaningful infection in these uh, people based upon these symptoms showing up. And that was quite uh, eye-opening to me. So um, our group here at Sunnybrook and the Bayview site, uh, Andrew Seymour, and Alison McGear from Mount Sinai. Mark Loeb, I think, was in Hamilton, did a study in 2000 looking at what was going on in long-term care and why people might have had cultures done, residents of long-term care, why they might have gotten treated. And they sat down with the physicians and nurses I think this is helpful for us in the hospital, and I, I will be mindful of wrapping up, that um, really there were a lot of non-specific symptoms that people weren't doing so well, and that the urine was something that was easy to do, and you got a result, and that it was very important that the physicians and the nurses had worked together as a team to say, well, we've got a culture result. Does that mean anything clinically? What's the patient's clinical status? What's the resident's clinical status? Knowing that people in long-term care have cognitive issues. And so 
the punchline from this study was that uh, can we work together as healthcare uh, workers, physician, nursing, allied health to do better in terms of urine cultures and treating? Can we culture fewer people? Can we treat fewer people? Are they going to be any worse off? Can we learn together what to do? How do we interpret the results? So they actually did five years later in the BMJ a prospective study and um, really the key in this was to try and work through um, you know, has there been a change in the patient? Are there symptoms or signs? Do we, um, do we not see any symptoms? We have time. We have time to wait. Let's assess the person. And in doing so, we can um, actually see fewer cultures being done and realize that people are not going to become septic. And so there's a number of these flow sheets that have come forward. They've been readjusted, but um, what they did find over the year were the nurses and the physicians in long-term care worked together that way, rather than just having a culture, really looked at the patient and realized they weren't gonna become septic, that one third fewer antibiotics were ordered, and they're actually getting fewer urine cultures done. So we're coming up to the end now. So a number of clinical practice guidelines have come forward saying that we should do fewer cultures. We should really do them when we're getting a signal that it is the urinary tract. People are sick. In the setting of non-specific signs, we need to look at other areas. Don't forget about the chest. Don't forget about hydration. And these are non-catheterized people. And that fever should be a signal to treat um, absence of fever. We say, well, older people don't necessarily get fever. They can get really sick. Again, too much urine culture going on. People are not necessarily going to become septic from this cystitis. This is a flow sheet that the RGP has up on the website, which is trying to incorporate these findings. And really it is uh, pay attention to the clinical picture and to localizing symptoms or signs to the lower urinary tract. Uh, I'll skip forward. Uh, the take home is uh, bacteria colonization is common. Half the people get it. We don't need to rush off to antibiotics. Pyelonephritis, yes, we do. Uh, cystitis is the challenge, the bladder infection. Look carefully and don't forget the um, the respiratory tract. If somebody's not doing well, don't don't forget to check there, because it may not be so obvious. There's some work going on for specific markers of inflammation in the bladder using interleukin markers for the urine, which may help us. So it may be a very different dipstick test that comes in the next five years, which would be great. Prevention is about better hygiene, hydration. Keep that good microbiome, nutrition, mobility, and to try and keep people continent. Thanks very much. Sorry that over time. Please, please, yeah, go ahead, Mary Grace. Yeah. Um, thank you for that very thought-provoking talk today. I think that a lot of us have a lot to think about. Um, but in regards to the comment you made early on around um, the findings specific to respiratory um, symptoms, uh, and I think you just mentioned there was pneumonia. Was that pneumonia diagnosed prior to the UTI uh, coming up with the question, or was that subsequent to the UTI being ruled out? It's a very good question. So the, I'll repeat it in case you know it was picked up on the microphone. So when in those close to 30% of cases, there was pneumonia, respiratory infection, and uh, a urinary culture that was positive. Did they know about the respiratory system and the infection? Uh, they didn't detail, but there were comments in the paper that sometimes they did, many times they did not. They kind of got, oh, here's the urine culture, we can stop now. It's too hard to get a sputum. Uh, they don't seem to have breathing problems. 
So I think it is important that the respiratory infection was an occult, an unrecognized problem enough of the time. So you need to think, I have urinary tract. Did I check the chest in this older person? Because that can be quiet. I think that's the message from it. Welcome. Really interesting that this presentation is happening the same week we had a presentation about knowledge transfer. Um, because clearly we have a lot to learn. And what I'm, what I'm curious to know is are you aware of, there's so much going on in terms of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, is this sort of content, is this getting out there? Is this something we can expect to hear more about? Because I, I, I'm one of these people who carry around a lot of these myths. I, I'm, First one to say, go ahead and start on antibiotics. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, obviously there's a lot of education that needs to take place. Yeah. Um, the answer is I don't think so. And I thank um, my colleague with a respiratory infection for saying, <laughs> <laughs> why should talk about that? Because um, I, I learned from it. It was painful. There was a lot more reading than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to read one paper, it'll be good. <laughs> and so I, I think it. It sort of opened up. I spoke with um, Dr. Larry Robinson this morning, and he was going to look at the recording. He said, yeah, this is maybe a quality control initiative we can think about, um, because I was quite surprised with the randomized study that it sure looks like you have cystitis. We all agree it's a bladder infection. You get Advil. You get antibiotic. Randomized. I don't know what's in the pill, but here we go. And that... Uh, the antibiotic treated people got better, women got better one day earlier. But I don't know about that reinfection, what happened there, or did you know the, the antibiotic associated diarrhea, all those worries. So I don't think it's getting up quite so much. These are colleagues in infectious disease, they're from Sinai and the Bayview campus. 2005 was the last paper. There have been some more American papers. So I think it might be worth looking at because I don't know how many cultures we do. And obviously it came up from discussion. Yeah. This week we did a review of our brother and their interest in And one of the consensus was geriatrics. No. no, 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 don't, don't. You know what? It was good medicine to go through it. The last bit, the, the, the nursing home one, that, that was conducted here in Ontario and I can't remember the northern states, that paper, the 2005 paper of the British Medical Journal. The important thing is that, is that yeah, where they saw 35% less antibiotic use, less urine culture, fewer urine cultures being done, the critical thing was mortality in the nursing home did not go up. Transfers out for urinary sepsis did not increase. So those, I didn't mention that there's so much, but the things we worry about, but if I don't treat this, what might happen? Well, it doesn't look like that change. It looks like if the life-threatening infection is gonna happen, it doesn't migrate upwards through uh, uh, cystitis to that. It looks like it just comes when it's going to come. So, so our sense, when we look at our data, yeah. that it did, those patients actually got sick. Um, yeah. I don't think we can actually yeah. prove it either. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. And again, this was, I think, 20 different uh, long term care centers. Uh, like the French one over a week, it was uh, 48 different hospitals. So it's the sampling bias we worry about. And, and that's why going to these bigger papers was helpful while you said, hey, have a look at the literature. Yeah. What was yeah. is that you, you complained about the fact that many of the charts that were pulled for us to review actually hadn't broken. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and you and I talked about I'm going to be coming and talking, and I knew you did the charts, but we didn't talk about any of the other stuff. Unlike, you know, the magicians who come up and pick the guy from the audience. 
So that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay.